Arsenal. Uh, good evening to everyone um, watching us now. Uh, it's Wednesday and it's our weekly live Q&A on COVID-19 with Dr. Mike Ryan and Dr. Maria Lampico. Um, this probably will be our last Q&A in this year. Um, so we invite you to ask all your questions um, that you have at the moment. We will try to sum up what we've done in this year uh, in the COVID-19 response and also how we can spend upcoming holidays safely as we all would like to be with our loved ones. Uh, but depending on where we live, it may be a little bit more difficult than, than for, for others. Um, good afternoon, actually good evening, my Maria. It's almost, I mean, it's evening here. Um, we are hitting the end of the 2020 and uh, we've been in this emergency since day one of 2020. Um, what, would, what is your reflection on this year? Looking back at the 1st of January and now we are 16 December, how things have changed, how it was at the beginning in comparison to how our work is happening at the moment. So thanks Alex for having us again. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Uh, part of me can't believe that we're uh, in December of 2020 right now. It feels like uh, January 2020 was minutes ago, and it feels like it was 10 years ago at the same time. Um, I think, you know, reflecting back on that, it was um, those early days were so, um, uh, we were so focused. You know, there was a very strong professional calm uh, with an energy of, you know, just focused on what we need to do. Um, it was around the holidays, and so not everybody was back from, from break yet, and so we had many teleconferences, and I just remember thinking, you know, of, ha of the hard work that everybody was working on, um, and there was, this, there was this persistence, and there was this focus, and there was this calm um, and intensity about what, what needed to be done. But if, I mean, reflecting on the year, it's, it's been an exhausting year, it's been um, an inspiring year in many respects, and it's been a tragic year. So it kind of covers the gamut for me in terms of reflection. Um, but I think ending of the year is, it's also been a hopeful year, you know, in terms of what we've seen people be able to come together to do um, against a, an invisible enemy. Um, so I don't know, I, I run the gamut in terms of thinking, of reflecting over the, over the whole year, but um, I'm very proud to have been part of this team here at WHO and working with Mike, working with you, working with the teams um, that we're so fortunate to work with, not only here in headquarters, but in our regions and our countries and across the world. So it's, it's a mix. I, I mixed, you know, um, thinking back, but also feeling hopeful thinking forward. Thank you, Maria. Mike, what yeah. are your reflections mm -hmm. looking back into the whole 2020? Um, not very much the same feeling as uh, as uh, as Maria, but uh, <clears throat> in a sense too, this isn't uh, this isn't our first rodeo e either, and this is our job. This is what we do: emergencies, and uh, you know we're picking up a thousand events a month that have to be verified and checked, and uh, constantly responding. We have thirty graded emergencies we're currently responding to that aren't COVID. Uh, <clears throat> so the last, it's not just the last year, the last two and a half three years um, have been very demanding you know we've had two Ebola outbreaks we've had cholera outbreaks measles outbreaks last Christmas last holiday when this thing broke on 31st of December our big concern over the holiday period is we had teams in, Pap in uh, Western Samoa we had uh, I think 14 children on ventilators in Western we were using up you know now we've heard these stories of using up ventilators and how you know, intensive care units are full. The intensive care, care units in Western Samoa were full this time last year. They were full of ki kids struggling to breathe on ventilators because of measles, a disease for which we have a vaccine. And we were struggling with that reality. <clears throat> we were struggling still with Ebola. We were struggling uh, with cholera outbreaks, Rift Valley fever, uh, Lassa fever in, in, in Nigeria, so many other diseases. And we're doing that all the time. Uh, same in dealing with the humanitarian uh, context of Yemen and of Syria and of Iraq and of Libya. And there are so many millions of people out there. And especially as you approach holiday periods, you think of those people, those refugees, those kids living in camps in northwestern Syria, in the people 
in, in Tigray today, the people in, in, in South Sudan, the people in, in eastern Libya and other places where people are struggling to access health care, struggling to access food. Um, and as we move on, we move on to celebrate our holidays. There, there's a lot of people around the world who have very little to celebrate at this time, and we should think of them. I always think it's interesting. I always think of those people in holiday times, and it doesn't prevent me celebrating with my family, but it makes me feel much more privileged to have that opportunity uh, and to understand that uh, this is a dream that so many people around the world don't have this year and may never have unless we continue to do our job. So for us, I think that's uh, this event broke over the, the last year's holiday. And again, it uh, was uh, really efficiently dealt with by, by the teams um, and obviously grew into, into, this, uh, into this terrible uh, pandemic. Uh, so for me, the, uh, the experience has been probably the most demanding uh, of us in so many ways of any event. And I've been through SARS and H1N1 pandemic and multiple Ebola outbreaks and cholera outbreaks and other things. It's been very demanding on everybody. Um, uh, on communities, on individuals, on businesses, on schools, on teachers, on students, on frontline doctors and nurses, on decision makers, policy. Nobody has le been re left untouched by this pandemic. <clears throat> and yet, uh, as we end the year, I think many people should be proud of what they've done to serve their communities over the last year. So it's a mixture of pride in what has been done to save lives and sadness at the lives we've lost. Um, and, and a sense of exhaustion yeah. at the effort made. I'm being very honest with you, you know, mm -hmm. it's we're tired. Uh, we're tired. <laughs> but uh, families should do that. Families should think about. I agree with what you just said, Mike. The families, you know, all of us should ask the question you just asked, like of think, thinking back on the year and what we've what we've done. I mean, I know a lot of people do this around the holiday time and they do this around the New Year time of kind of reflecting on that. But I think that every family sitting there does need to think about how how did we help what did we do to help because so many people helped in so many different ways whether not just you know in the occupations that people have in the frontline workers who we owe so much to and continue to owe so much to um, essential workers but every family kids you know and drawing over the pictures or clapping outside or everyone's contributed to that and people should feel feel proud of that and then we should ask what should we what can we do more what more can we do and how are we going to help end this? Because we are going to end this. I might mention it, everyone, every each of us have been affected with the with the pandemic, and yeah. we we like to say we are in this this together. So, in in that regard, I would just remind our viewers that they can ask their questions if they are watching us on Twitter by using the hashtag #AskWHO. If you're watching us on LinkedIn, YouTube, or Facebook, please leave your com questions via comment section and please note that we will be moderating questions to uh, take those that are relevant to conversation including on, on, on COVID-19. Um, looking as well to the whole year, Maria, can you maybe walk us through the epidemiological situation? What, we, what were the phases that we've seen and what's the current situation after one year? So it's, I mean, it's a very mixed picture where we are one year on. I mean, I think uh, in the beginning when we when we were looking at this, you know, it, it's 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 grown obviously over time, and and the virus has spread. And many countries right now, um, in December 2020, uh, have their societies opened up again. They've been able to control transmission. Um, they've been able to very quickly identify any resurgence in cases or clusters, carry out these, these cluster investigations and, and stamp it out. You know, these little embers of fire have not been able to take off. Um, and then there are countries that are going through these mixed patterns of, you know, a peak of, of, of activity bringing down to control, a peak in activity bringing down to control. Uh, many countries in Europe are in, in that situation right now. Um, where to me and to us shows us that the interventions that they've put in place can bring this virus under control. It's just maintaining that level of control while opening up societies again. And that's a very delicate balance. Um, there are many countries that have gone through one big peak, you know, and brought it down under control and are, and are doing a good job. A lot of Asia is in this situation. Many countries across Africa are in this situation. We've had a number of countries that have prevented uh, the virus from taking off. Many island states, for example, um, have not uh, allowed the virus to really seed an epidemic and, and take off. And then we have some countries, unfortunately, that are really still in 
unbelievably intense transmission. Um, and they are going through a very difficult time. Um, so it's a mixed picture of where we are. But the patterns that we've seen in terms of transmission um, are the same as we, we saw in the beginning. You know, the virus is, is predictable in the sense of we know how it spreads between people. Um, and importantly, so we know what are the steps that we need to take to be able to break those chains of transmission to end those outbreaks. Um, and that's really critical. It's just making sure that we follow through on all of those actions. And in areas where we've brought transmission down, we keep it down. So the picture itself is mixed in terms of the epidemiology. Um, and we may see a similar pattern going into 2021, but there is no inevitability here. We know that with the actions that can be put in place, which are very difficult, um, but at individual level, family level, community level, leadership level, whether it's political leaders or religious leaders or community leaders or youth leaders, all of us have a role to play in keeping that transmission down. And we have the tools in our power to, to do that. Vaccination will be another very powerful tool that will help, but it will take time for vaccines to be rolled out across the world. And it will take time for vaccines and vaccination to have an impact on the epidemiology. It will have an impact. Um, and it will first and foremost really focus on reducing morbidity and mortality, but it will impact transmission as well. It'll just take some time for it to roll out across the world. Thank you, Maria. You mentioned we have the tools and we've been consistently talking about it, but I'm just thinking maybe we should remind our viewers once again, what are the tools that each of us as individual can use to, to protect ourselves and our loved ones? Or maybe Mike? That's our superpower. It's <laughs> superpower. Toolbox is your superpower, right. Maria. Toolbox is my superpower. No, it, it's, it's um, you know, we'll, we'll just keep repeating it because I think it's worth, it's worth repeating for people to understand that they have tools and they have some control over what is happening. Um, some of these tools are, are individual measures that we can take. Probably one of the most important things we could do is the physical distancing. You know, keeping ourselves distanced from other people and the, you know, the further the better that we can. Um, the addition of masks, using masks um, in situations where you are close to others, um, where you have poor ventilation. Um, making sure you practice hand hygiene. Um, and especially when you're wearing masks, make sure you, ha you, you wear masks safely. You have clean hands before you put them on. You wear them appropriately over your nose and your mouth, uh, not on your ear and not on your elbow, and you know, making sure you wear them. Um, you practice respiratory etiquette and you sneeze into your elbow. Um, information is a tool that we have. Information about knowing what your risk is uh, throughout your day. Um, avoiding crowded spaces, um, you know, teleworking if you can, uh, telemedicine if you can, um, knowing where the virus is circulating and taking steps to minimize your exposure to that virus is really, really critical. And the decisions you make based on that information and based on, based on the tools you have, these are all part of, part of the tools and part of that toolkit that we have. Vaccines and vaccination are another tool. Um, and they are another very powerful tool, which I know everyone is very excited about and hopeful of. Um, but we still need to continue with all of these other individual level measures that we have, um, whether it's the, like I said, the distancing, the hand hygiene, the masks, the opening of windows, the avoiding crowded spaces, all of that needs to be done um, as, we move it, as we move forward. Thank you, Maria. Mike, um, can you re maybe reflect on the progress that we've made during this pandemic response, and what are the, the biggest challenges that we've faced in the response? Um, lots of progress, not as much as, I would, as we would want at this point, but that's it's life when you're dealing with a new virus, uh, and still many challenges ahead. Uh, reflecting on what just what Maria said there about what we need to do, and I think it does reflect maybe one of the achievements is our greater understanding of the dynamics around transmission, the multiple modes of transmission, the different ways in which this virus can transmit, uh, and the, the, the context and the settings and the circumstances in which risks are higher. And it may not seem like a lot of learning, but there's a lot of learning in that and a lot of understanding. And really, it's one thing understanding a virus and its structure, and it's one thing that's really important, and it's really important for us to understand the <clears throat> The, the biology and all of that. But uh, unless that really converts into behaviors that we can use to avoid the virus, then it's not helping us very much. So I think we've learned a lot about that. And I think, you know, it comes down to that issue of location, duration, and intensity. Where you are, <coughs> how long you're there, and the kind of activity you're engaging in in that environment 
Um, is the location itself safe? Where is it? How many people are going to be there? What is the density of people that's going to be there? How long are you going to be there? Uh, and 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 uh, and the intensity of the activity. You know, it's interesting to me as we've learned of the virus that being in a room with a bunch of people sitting quietly is very different to being in a room with a bunch of people who are singing loudly, mm -hmm. uh, and the different risks that that can represent. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, the issues around uh, ventilation and ensuring that you're in a well-ventilated space, the, the use of masks in those settings where you can't uh, manage your risk uh, by other means. All of those things have come together. And it's been a long and tough debate. We've had to learn how all of these different things. So I think we've, we've progressed around that. And I think we've also progressed around trusting people uh, to, to be their own risk managers. I mean, at the end of the day, yes, you can introduce the, all of these uh, measures and you can mandate public health and social measures and you can lock down and shut down and do stay-at-home stay orders. But <clears throat> in effect, unless people are committed to that, people find ways around. We used to be asked about quarantines and shutting down areas and quarantining areas, and we used to advise against it because the minute you shut, we, we had the same issue in Ebola and Congo. People were saying you should shut the border with Uganda. And we didn't shut the border with Uganda because we felt it was better to manage the risk and keep trade and the movement of people visible so we could track the virus rather than falsely shutting the border and seeing people cross illegally and everything go underground and then we lose sight of the virus. So it's a bit like surveillance of, 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 of a virus is like surveillance of a criminal. If you, if you apply too much of that pressure, you can drive everything underground and then you lose sight and visibility. Uh, and in that sense, we've learned that keeping this virus in plain sight is the best way to do things. Uh, keeping that openness and transparency and surveillance, tracking that virus, doing expanded testing and strategically expanding testing to increase our understanding. That's been progress uh, in terms of our understanding of the virus and its transmission uh, dynamics. We've made huge progress in terms of our partnerships and working within the UN system with NGO partners, with civil society, with youth groups, with religious groups, with work, uh, the world of work. WHO has reached out more than ever before, working with others on social engagement, on communications, on risk communication, on infodemic management. We've really made more progress there than maybe any other area relative to where we were before. And I think that means we're developing new ways of engaging with communities, particularly with, with, with youth, and, and, and not through the traditional means. And we're having to learn. We're, you know, we're getting taught by you lot out there that there's a whole new world of communications, right? And, uh, and uh, we have to adapt to that. It's not that you have to adapt to us. We need to adapt to your world and the way in which you communicate and the way in which you consume information uh, and uh, not force you to conform with our way of communicating, which is ne that's never going to happen, right? Um, so I think that learning, and I, maybe I'm not giving you the really nice scientific achievements or progress, and maybe Maria can speak more, but to be a year in to a disease and have the sequences that we had within a number of days of the virus being confirmed, mm -hmm. to have uh, the understanding we have of the the, the the structure of the virus and the proteins and, and everyone can talk about spike proteins. I mean, that was geek language a year and a half ago. If you went into a room and started speaking about spike proteins, you know, people were probably thinking about it. That's is that a kind of a cocktail or what is it? You know, <laughs> <laughs> now people are you know gladly having conversations about changes in the binder uh, in, in the receptor binding domain of the spike protein. I'm thinking, hang on a second, this is a parallel universe. And I love that democratization of information, where science is no longer just the purview of the scientists in the labs. And, <clears throat> and that translation of science into those structures, and you, know, you now have wonderful people who work in, in, in animation and in graphic art and design, interpreting all that science and bringing it to people. I think that's brilliant. Uh, so that ability to explain science has, is improving and people's willingness to engage in understanding biology and how these processes work uh, has been great over the years. So I, I think the areas where I see progress are in those softer areas where we're learning how to do things uh, better. Uh, but again, going back to what you originally spoke about, you know, I mean, the, the, the challenge now for us is to keep doing it all, yep. keep doing it smart and keep doing it consistently. Recognizing the vaccine is coming, it's fantastic. But the vaccine is not the immediate solution. The vaccine is going to take time. 
Uh, the cavalry is coming, yes. <laughs> but uh, it's going to come, you know, uh, it's going to come uh, 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 slowly and in a planned way, we hope. So uh, that for me is what we, the challenge I think we face going forward. And also, we, we still have challenges in equity. I mean, it's, we, we can't escape the reality that, uh, that we are struggling to get the resources we need to ensure that we get vaccine for uh, the, everyone who needs it. So some people in all countries rather than all people in some countries. That's a fact. And we have a choice to make as a global society. Um, we have health workers all over the world who have fought in the front line for the last year. Has a health worker in, uh, uh, in uh, an African country or a health worker in Cox Bazaar or a health worker in a refugee camp or a health worker in Venezuela or a health worker in Bolivia, are, are, are they contributed just as much as a health worker in Europe or in North America? They have. They've stood in the front line. So when we start distributing vaccines, when we say health workers are a priority, does that mean only some health workers? Or is that all health workers? We have some questions to ask ourselves over the holiday period. And when we talk about older and more vulnerable people, does that mean older and more vulnerable people in developed countries? Or is that older and more vulnerable people everywhere? Our deal, the deal we put to the world, of some people in all countries, and those some people are the ones at highest risk and the highest vulnerability and the highest risk of dying. And we have to make good on that. Or we will not be the world that we want to become. We want to become a fairer, more equitable world. We want to become a world that can tackle climate change and share responsibility for solutions and share responsibility for the things we want for the future. This is the first opportunity to demonstrate we can do that fairly and equitably. And I still have my concerns. I am deeply hopeful that we have the the, 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 the means in place to do it. But I have to say, coming into the Christmas period, it's time for us all to hold ourselves and our governments to account for that promise. Because that's a promise we've made to the world. Thank you very much, Mike. And um, I think it's very good you mentioned uh, equity as, as an objective and solidarity. Because I'll, I've, I've received a lot of follow-up questions while you were talking about equitable distribution of vaccines. Mm -hmm. Some people are t write, uh, writing us from Africa mm -hmm. and whether they will be able to receive a vaccine. Mm -hmm. On the other side, there is someone from Europe saying, country where I live has more uh, probability to get vaccines for me and people around me, but what about a uh, developing world? So can we maybe share with our viewers what WHO has been doing uh, in the past year to ensure first the development of vaccines and once they are ready to, mm -hmm. to be uh, distributed equitably as, as you explained? Yes, and again, remember, we've done this before uh, collectively. Uh, WHO is currently working to introduce a new version of the polio vaccine, which will be distributed equitably in the areas of need. We did that with Ebola vaccine. We brought Ebola vaccine right to the heart of Africa, right to the heart of Ebola. There are more people vaccinated in Africa today against Ebola than there are in all the other continents in the world put together, because that's where the need was. We've done that with yellow fever vaccine. We've done that with cholera vaccine. There are more people vaccinated for cholera in Africa and in cholera cholera at risk countries than there are anywhere else in the world. So we have managed in the past to find products and put them where they're needed. When you have a global pandemic like this, though, the need is everywhere. At the same time. At the same time. And that's the, that's the, that's the challenge. Um, we want to see that equity. The COVAX facility of the ACT Accelerator, which COVAX is the, the, uh, the name of it, but that is a collaboration of uh, WHO, of, of Gavi, the the vaccine initiative of CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic uh, Preparedness, um, uh, and many other, UNICEF and so many other agencies have come together to try and build a consortium to do advanced market commitments for vaccines from various companies. But remember, the vaccines that have come on stream now are the mRNA, the RNA vaccines. They're smaller volumes, they're quite expensive products. Um, um, and uh, there are a whole series of other vaccines coming through the pipeline. So in terms of eventually, will there be large amounts of dis distribution to all countries? Yes. The difficulty we have, we have very small volumes of two vaccines that have come through first that are the most expensive, for which many developed countries have already purchased much of that production. 
And we're working with those countries to see whether or not they would be able to contribute a small proportion of their current supply to initiate vaccination, particularly of health workers, in places uh, like Africa, so we can show that solidarity. But there will be a lot of vaccine coming through that pipeline of COVAX over the year, uh, and a lot of careful negotiation is underway to do that. Um, and there are other countries that are coming on stream as well, willing to, to build partnership to deliver vaccines in, in, in all countries. So I have great hope for that, and, and, and my previous statement was more to say we need to make good on our promise. That's what I'm saying. Uh, and I think we will, but we're going to have to work hard at that. And we're going to have to hold ourselves and our politicians and our institutions accountable for that promise. Uh, because uh, everyone matters and, and every, uh, every vulnerable person matters, every health worker matters. And the DG has said it many, many times. We need to start with some people in all countries, not all people in some countries. And that has meaning, both epidemiologically in terms of being a good approach to stopping the deaths and stopping the transmission, but it also has meaning when it comes to the ethics of this process and the concepts of equity. You can't, uh, sorry, I was going to use a word there, I won't, you know. <laughs> but uh, you, 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 you have to be honest to ethical principles, you have to try. Not everything you do in life will result in fairness. But if you don't start out with a fair approach, it guarantees will not be fair. Uh, it will not be equitable. And uh, we need to keep equity and access at the center of this whole discussion. I'm sorry to re-emphasize it, Alex, but your, your viewers are absolutely correct. And the youth who are out there, your job is to hold everyone to account for that. Uh, because it's your planet afterwards. And do we want to start 2021? We go into the third decade of the 20th century, the 20s. It's always a great decade <laughs> in any century. Uh, if we're going into that, it's, that's the decade of the young. And if we're going to do that, why don't we start that with one of the greatest demonstrations of equity and access and fairness to end the pandemic? Wouldn't that be a great gift to the future? Um, and uh, everyone has a role in holding everybody to account for that. Um, I can't say that loudly enough. That's not just for the, the big people sitting on top of the, the global systems or the national systems. Everybody has a right to speak on this issue, and they should. Thank you very much, Mike. And Maria, Mike mentioned as well older people, and that, for example, as one of the, the populations at risk that should be prioritized in all countries, not just in the developed world. One of our viewers is asking, how does COVID-19 affect the elderly? I know we were talking about it throughout the year, but maybe this is the opportunity to remind as well, as and having in mind holidays coming and some of us will go and visit our grandparents or parents who may be older. Uh, so uh, as well, how to keep them safe. Yeah, so this, this virus, um, we know that there are certain populations that are at risk for developing severe disease and at risk for dying. Um, and those individuals are people of advanced age, people who are over 60, over 70, over 80 years old, and that risk increases with age. We also know that people with underlying condition are at a higher risk of developing severe disease. So there's a direct impact of the virus itself on the body in terms of their ability, but there's also an impact on, on everyone, but including older people's mental health as well because many people who are of older age, um, they may be living in long-term living facilities, they may be living in, um, away from their loved ones and they haven't been able to see their loved ones for quite some time. So there are different types of impacts, I think, on older individuals that um, have been very difficult during this pandemic. Um, but, but primarily, one of the big worries that we have is if an older person is infected, if, an old, if someone of underlying, has an underlying condition, they're at an increased risk of, of uh, developing severe disease, needing hospitalization, needing ventilation, um, and dying. And so we really want to do everything that we can to prevent that. Um, to keep them safe, um, you know, it's the same measures that we recommend for everyone in terms of physical distancing and mask wearing and hand hygiene. And, but there's a particular risk of individuals who are living in long-term li living facilities. And in many countries, in, the, in some countries in the beginning of this pandemic, um, there was really a devastating impact of individuals living in those type of long-term homes. And if the virus had an opportunity to enter the home, it could spread uh, quite easily. And um, 
And if an older person was infected, then the mortality rates would be very high. So um, some countries have, have, many countries have worked very, very hard to prevent that from happening and to take measures to make sure that um, there's plans in place, there's screenings that are taking place so that the virus doesn't have an opportunity to enter. Um, and if it does, then there's plans in place to make sure that it doesn't spread. And so there's, we've seen a lot of advancement in this area. We need to do more. Uh, we must do more. Um, but one of the priority groups of, of vaccination um, are the older age groups. And um, our SAGE group has outlined different populations that, that should be prioritized. And countries are, are, are taking decisions right now you know, about how they will roll out vaccination based on the vaccines that they have. Um, and I know most are, are prioritizing the, the older age groups. We've seen some wonderful images of, of people being vaccinated, either old, of older um, people or frontline workers. But again, as Mike had just pointed out, we want to see images of vaccination from all over the world. Uh, and we want to see that happen sooner rather than later in, in all countries um, and not just uh, some of the, the high income countries. And I, I wanted to just quickly reflect on, on the earlier question you asked about the biggest achievement in the vaccine. Most people, I think, will say, you know, the achievement of the year has been vaccination. And it is. I mean, it's incredible. But the, the vaccination effort, the vaccine development effort, um, really kicked into gear, obviously, as soon as we had the sequence. But that work also began before COVID was even known, because there were all these developers and platforms that were being developed for coronaviruses. And as part of the R&D blueprint, uh, the research and development blueprint for epidemics, um, which was established several years ago, um, focused on high threat pathogens and priority pathogens and disease X. And one of those disease X was a coronavirus, you know, a high threat respiratory pathogen. And there was a lot of effort uh, undertaken by, through collaboration um, with partners like CEPI, um, with, you know, different uh, vaccine manufacturers like the Jenner Institute, for example, that started work on a MERS vaccine several years ago and could quickly adapt for this, for this pandemic. So it, it accelerated that development for this. And I just wanted to highlight that because many people think, you know, it began only a few months ago, but it took time and it takes time and that's built on collaboration. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to highlight one of the less shiny things. Good old fashioned epidemiology has been the achievement of carrying out transmission dynamic studies, household transmission studies, cluster investigations. Sure zero epidemiology those are the studies that gave us the key parameters to say how the virus transmits when somebody transmits during the course of their infection before they have symptoms at the time they have symptoms while they have symptoms um, where transmission is amplified so these settings and these contexts and these intensity driven things that that mike was describing the context of transmission so these um pieces of information were um, identified and found you know, very early in the pandemic from early studies in China, from studies in, in Korea, from studies in Thailand, from study, you know, as the pandemic um, evolved and as countries were impacted by this, all of those critical studies and each time that study was replicated helped us better understand. Like mm -hmm. some of these, these early findings have now come into sharper focus but there haven't been dramatic changes in terms of what we understand about how this virus spreads or how the, of the disease that it causes. There are exceptions to that because the long-term effects is something we're only beginning to learn about and that's something we didn't know in the beginning. But I just wanted to highlight the good old-fashioned epidemiology and the public health interventions that are critical for every emerging pathogen, every alert that Mike mentioned we rely on those early studies that help disentangle what is the virus, how does it spread, who is it impacting, what are the control measures that can be put in place. Those were the five questions that we, or four questions or, that we ask every single time. That was the same for this virus and those investigations, and we're really grateful for all of those early investigations, basic epidemiology, Epi 101 as we, as we call it, um, that have really fueled our understanding. And so I just wanted to highlight that because the vaccine is an incredible achievement, but we cannot forget the basics. And I think many countries that teach the basics to many parts of the world are really understanding that those basics have to be done in their countries as well. Mm -hmm. And so and it, even looking at the, the lab work that was done, 
I mean, you know, getting genetic sequences up on the web 10th, 11th of January. Amazing. Uh, it took months from previous outbreaks. Um, Years in some, some cases. cases. Yeah. Uh, getting the laboratory assays, standardized laboratory assays, ready by about the 14th. Thir of we, we published the first assay on the 13th of January with, that, with and partners. That means that's the standardized sort of blueprint. It's like the it's cookbook, it's the cookbook yeah. for, for making diagnostics. And then and then to have the diagnostics made within our collaborating centre network, particularly at the Charité in, uh, in Berlin. Mm -hmm. um, and Christian Dustin and the people up there, shout out to you, yeah. our heroes. Um, and doing that openly, there was there was no one making a profit. There, these scientists were doing this. I mean, someone could have patented this, copyrighted that, whatever. No, they did it, and they put it out there, and they put it on the web, and they gave those assays out. And then the companies came in and made the diagnostics. And I remember, I think by the twenty second, twenty third of January, we had a diagnostic, and then we had to do massive contracts quickly to get it spun out. And by the second of February, we were sending diagnostic tests. Now that doesn't sound super fantastic but i can tell you 25 years it's fantastic. super fantastic and it required trust and collaboration and people not worrying about their intellectual property not worrying about getting their publication in the next journal but actually doing the work and getting that done and that was central to us being able to to manage huge aspects of this think about this uh, our, co our colleagues in the uk with the recovery trial well yeah. oh, we have all the who have on new drugs and on new vaccines they took an old drug dexamethasone and they tried it in a trial. So far, it's a drug that's the only one that reduces mortality as a drug, dexamethasone. It's cheap as chips, very available, uh, and yet it saves lives, 30% reduction in mortality. Who'd have thunk when they were starting that out, when they were going back to an old drug, and I'm sure people were saying to them, well, what are you doing that for? You know, this is not the sexy end of the research field. But they found, right now, the only drug that's significantly associated with reducing deaths in a hospital setting in severe patients. It gives patients very close to death real hope of, um, of survival. So again, it needs a, in Ireland, they, they say it takes a village to bring up a child. You know, it's everybody's responsibility. And this is the same here. Uh, it's, it's science, it's, it's industry, it's communities working together. Uh, with some kind of a goal and driven not by their own individual needs and you see so many examples of this and we just started the question with older people i mean the thing you don't want to be in the quadrifecta or the trifecta is to be an older person from an ethnic minority in an underserved community um, with underlying conditions and poor access to health care this is what's killing people not just the virus it's underprivileged it's lack of access it's years and years of living with health conditions that haven't been properly managed because you, because of the color of your skin or because of your ethnicity or because of your social group, you don't have access to the same services, prevention services and treatment services as other people. Or the cost of that would impoverish you or your family. I know men and women who deny themselves health care so they can save money for their children if they get sick. And they know if they spend that money on themselves, they will impoverish the family. And there are hundreds of thousands, millions of families out there making those choices today. So much and all as we say we're advancing in the world, this is still a deeply unfair, deeply inequitable world, in which access to the basic human right of health is something that is given by privilege and by how much money you have. We want to change that. We can't change it overnight. We're not knights in shining armor. But behind and underneath this pandemic, COVID-19 has caused devastation. But it's equally uncovered, ripped away the bandages from a really old wound that this society has. And that is our failure to deliver equitable health care, a failure to recognize health as a fundamental human right. And the fact that we leave people in difficult health circumstances, sometimes decades, forgotten in the communities in which they live in refusing to deliver them basic health care. And then we wonder why they die like flies when a new virus comes along. We're surprised, really. You know, we've got some things to fix here. And it's not just vaccines and it's not just COVID. We've got to fix a lot of things in our society. Uh, and we better start doing it soon because we don't know when the next virus is coming. We climb this hill of COVID, who knows what happens next? We need to build a more secure, safe environment for our kids and everyone else to live within. Health security is not an abstract concept. Health security is about fairness, it's about equity, and older people 
are paying an awful price in disease, in loneliness, in isolation, and so many other things. But there are others suffering in the same way. Uh, I think our older people are tough. They're wonderful. They've suffered and borne this extremely well and with huge humility and huge pride. Uh, some of those people have been through world wars. They've suffered before. They've been through genocides in Europe and Africa and other places. Uh, they've seen and witnessed an awful lot. Uh, and they shouldn't have to go through this. And they certainly shouldn't have to suffer any more than they're suffering. Uh, and they certainly shouldn't be lonely for Christmas. And that's the big problem we have for holidays, is how do we honour our older people who may have to spend Christmas more alone than they've ever done in the past, uh, honour their wisdom and their contribution um, and for the opportunities they've given us without putting them at risk. And, and it's a trade-off. It's a real trade-off. There are no easy answers to this. I can sit here and tell you, you know, you do the right thing and you shouldn't, you know. But the reality is older, older people are lonely and they need that contact. They don't need your physical contact, <laughs> but they need to see people, they need to engage. Uh, and it's tough at this holiday time for people to, to do that. So we have to find creative ways of creating that sense of community over the holiday period. Um, so I think. And I, th I think that's what, this is not a normal year. You know, I think, no, I think everyone can agree that this is not a normal year and this is not the end of the year that we had all anticipated, but we're seeing people be creative in, in how they can remain socially connected but physically distant. Um, and there's, of course, you know, the, the, the electronic version of that where you, you know, you celebrate over, over Zoom or FaceTime or, or all of the different platforms that are there. Um, but we have seen, you know, people who can go visit someone but not enter into a home and see them at a distance. Um, we've seen creative solutions where people have these big sheets of, um, you know, like your shower curtain, and they put holes in it and they can hug. And, and you know, when you don't hug someone for a long time, it, it's really quite incredible how you crave contact physical contact with people, and that is not something uh, that can be underestimated. So anyone that's gone through that, I did that for a little while with my family, and it was the worst two months of my life. I mean, it's just awful. Um, but, you know, we've, we've seen people be creative that way. But I think, I mean, for, for our family, you know, we're not able to travel uh, back to the States. And I was talking with my sister who loves Christmas and puts her Christmas tree up in early November. I'm calling you out, Elisa. But I said, keep your tree up until we can celebrate. You know, we're going to celebrate at some point when we travel to the States and we'll do it. I don't care if it's July or next October or I don't care. We're going to do that. And we're, we missed my parents' 50th anniversary, wedding anniversary. We're going to take that trip that we canceled at some point. And for, for us, it's not a consolation because we'll celebrate Christmas and we will find a way to celebrate, you know, connected somehow. And everyone is making those decisions right now. They're making decisions, do I need to travel? If I don't, how can I still be connected? Um, if I do travel, if I do see my family, how do I maybe quarantine myself for a little while? Or, or do I make sure that I, I don't visit vulnerable, or I wear a mask, or I'm, you know, how do I, how do I reduce the risk? Um, in some situations, the best option is to not have those big gatherings, but try to keep it as tight as possible mm -hmm. and celebrate with just your home. Um, and everyone needs to make those decisions, but our decisions matter. And so we need to understand that even though these are hard, they do have those, those consequences. But be creative and, and think into 2021, how am I going to celebrate that missed birthday that I had, that missed anniversary that I had, that missed you know, Christmas, Thanksgiving, Hanukkah, Diwali, everything. How are we going to do all that in 2021? To, for me, mentally, it helps. Um, it helps me. I don't know if it'll help anybody else, but thinking forward of like, we are going to get there, we will get there, and we're going to have one hell of a celebration when we do. It just, for me, is, is a mental health. But for those individuals who are older, who are worried that this might be my last Christmas or this might be my last, because we, none of us know. I mean, it could be all of our last Christmases. We just don't know. How do we make it meaningful? And it's okay not to be okay. It's okay not to be okay. You know, for people, you know, it's just tough on everybody. Yeah. Uh, everyone, everyone's at this point struggling and uh, we just gotta we just gotta yeah keep, get through keep it keep at it as best we can and hang on yeah hang on and, tight and and not lose our um sometimes stuff we've we've had it here in our teams you know yeah. it's really hard at times not to get tenchy and not to get sort of you know because what's really bothering you is the restriction what's bothering you is your lack of 
you know, see your kids. And it's, it's, sometimes it's it's easy to take that to work. It's easy to take that out in other people. And you know, you see that tension. And uh, everyone needs to kind of decompress and, and and find a way to to not have to focus on this thing all the time. And it is tough. It's it's like you know, every time you go out, every time you meet friends, you've got to be so conscious of it. something you were never conscious of in the past. Think about it. Like your physical distance between people touching other individual, other human beings. This is part of our social discourse. It's part of the way we exist. Um, um, and uh, it, for me, that's the hardest part of this overall for, for this pandemic. And that's what's so hard for people to understand when it comes to public health and social measures. It's like, what do you mean I can't touch people, I can't hug people, I can't be close to people? It's, it's really hard for people to... To, 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 to internalize that and everyone can say, okay, I'll do that for a few weeks, but what do you mean, do that for a year? You know, that's, that's pushing. And so I do think it is tough for everyone to, 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 to sustain all of this, but it, sometimes in life you just have no alternative. And right now, vaccines are coming, but they're not the immediate alternative to just maintaining our, our guard and maintaining our own individual risk management. And, you know, if there are people who are taking care of older persons, for example, as an example, and have to care for people. You just need to reduce the risk to the absolute minimum, yeah. you know, um, and, and try and find ways to do that. As you said, meeting outside. Mm -hmm. If you have to go and give assistance to an older person, uh, then there are situations where you should wear a mask if you're going to help someone. If you're already caring for an older person, you should be wearing a mask anyway if you're coming in from outside in most circumstances. So it's a matter of looking at every situation and saying to yourself, how can I, in this particular circumstance, reduce the risk of either one of us uh, giving disease to the other? Yeah. You know. Think of your, yourself, you know, and how you protect yourself, but think about your most favorite person in the world. Who is it that you want to protect? You know, who is it that, you know, you would do anything, COVID or not, who would you do anything to protect? I know who that is for me. There's a lot of them. Um, but what is it that I need to do to make sure that my kids stay safe and my husband stays safe? And if we were in the US, my in-laws and my, my parents, like I know I would take, I would do everything that I could. And a lot of these things that we're asking people to do are relatively straightforward. It's just keeping them up, you know, keeping it up for such a long period of time and understanding why. So it's not just about you, it's about your loved ones as well. And think about that individual being sick. And think about that individual dying alone in a hospital bed. You don't want that. We don't want that. I feel like we're being very negative, but I think that we have to outline the risk that this is still very serious, that there is hope on the horizon, and it's, and it's being um, released you know, around the world in terms of the vaccination. But it is going to take many months you know, for us to get to, to a point where we're seeing an impact of that. So do it for you, do it for your loved ones, but do it now and do it every day. Thank you very much, Bo. There are a lot of follow-up questions that are coming. I would read some of them. Okay. One is from LinkedIn and it's related to upcoming Christmas and New Year's celebrations. Will these festivities increase the risk of COVID-19 spread due to crowding? Um, what is your opinion? Yes. say it any other way. The, the question is, again, how much risk management is taken into account? So mm -hmm. someone says, oh, we should ban all the fireworks this place. Well, fireworks don't cause COVID. Mm -hmm. right? What causes COVID is a bunch of people getting together <laughs> in an unsafe way. Uh, if someone wants to have a, if a country allows it and uh, someone wants to have a fireworks display, that's fine. If everyone is properly distant and they're outside, yeah. uh, <laughs> then there's an issue. Uh, but if everyone is getting on public transport to go there and they're spending an hour on a bus and then they all get together inside because it's raining to watch the uh, yeah. fireworks outside, yeah. then that's dangerous. So I think we need to separate the idea of, pa of gatherings from what we call safe gatherings uh, and unsafe gatherings. It is still true that large multi-house, multi-family uh, communities type gatherings, particularly indoors, for long durations that involve activities that can result in higher levels of transmission, 
there's something that we need to avoid. Now, not every country. I mean, number, let's, let's be clear here. There are some countries that have very low incidence of, of COVID and they've done a magnificent job. And they're maybe uh, reaping the benefits of having an easier holiday period because they've managed to keep the disease under control. We're talking here specifically about countries that have intense community transmission in which this disease could go the other way. And many countries, for example, in Europe, in the last three or four weeks have really gained a lot of control. And, and the, the, the choices now are, if they relax before Christmas, uh, will it bounce back up again? That's a trade-off. And some countries are taking a very strict attitude, saying, no, we don't want this to go back up. Some are sort of saying, we'll take a break for a few days and <laughs> let everyone enjoy themselves a bit more. Uh, that could be foolhardy in this situation. The, the virus is not going to take a break over Christmas. So if we do things that will allow it to spread, I mean, we might want to break from the restrictions, but the virus will not take a break. Mm -hmm. And so we do need to make sure that we take the steps to, to, to minimize the transmission. Yeah. And, it's, and it's a hard, hard thing to say, but in some situations, we need to say the gatherings, the big gatherings shouldn't take place. And if you're in the, the, some of the challenges around the holidays and when you're with your loved ones is also you relax, you know, you let down your guard. You know, it's not just we're physically distant, we set the, the chairs apart like we are here, but we're going to be cooking dinner together, we're going to be cleaning up the dishes afterwards, we're going to be sitting around, you know, uh, watching a movie, watching a movie and, and cuddling, you know, the fireplaces and, you know, opening presents and singing or whatever. That's where it happens. It's not necessarily about just we can keep ourselves physically distanced the entire time. Think about your own family. You, you just, you relax. And that's what we worry about. So, um, again, people need to make decisions about how they're going to lower their risk. There's no zero risk right now. Um, but the virus is not going to take a break. And so, you know, we, I've heard these wartime uh, references of saying it's a ceasefire. Um, it's not the right analogy, because if you have a ceasefire with this virus, you're basically taking the, the ammunition away from one side, and that's the people. The virus is going to still shoot. And so we need to really make sure that we don't allow this virus to take that to take hold again. And countries like in Europe, for example, that are really bringing transmission down need to, to work hard to keep it down. So again, if maybe it's not the exact date of the holiday that we want to celebrate together, but maybe it's, it's a little bit into the future, but find a way to celebrate because everyone needs to find a way to celebrate the good in this year. There has been good in this year. Um, and think of the hopefulness for 2021 but that doesn't necessarily need to be physically together. Um, and the crowds, we need to avoid crowds. I mean, there's no question about that. Everyone needs to be in, in areas of intense transmission, avoid crowded settings, avoid uh, where there's many people indoors, especially where there's poor ventilation. No matter if you're wearing a mask and physical, I mean, there's a risk. So do what you can to minimize that risk. Thank you, Maria. This is not a question, but I'm sure you will like what I'm going to read. Uh, Heather Ross watching us on Facebook wrote the following. As an older person living alone in a different country, my friends who are in the same position and I have decided to postpone Christmas until it's either over or we all have been vaccinated. Stay home and stay safe. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for this, for this message and echoing what Mike and Maria were advising us. There are a few more questions I'd like to pass. This is very similar. Okay. Stephanie Lotus Baker, can there be anything done now for those suffering alone? And from uh, and the same from Stephanie. What about the mental health of those that are that aren't able to feel well without others around? Mm. That's tough. Mm. And there are people who struggle with uh, with, with uh, mental health issues already, and social contact is a big part of that and uh, of of therapy you know i mean what's the best the best therapy is very often people and social contact and people crave that uh, look again these are these are trade-offs uh, it's about reaching out if you have a friend who you're concerned about in terms of their mental health and loneliness as an individual you can reach out you can find ways to engage that person that don't involve 15 people going to a party you know it could be a cup of coffee across a wall or in the, if the coffee shops are open outside. It could be come to the door and just have a chat. Like, it's pick up the phone and make a phone call. So think of all the things we can do, rather than all the things we can't do. Uh, and creating and maintaining that social contact is, is very important. People suffer alone through holiday periods all the time. People, you know, we, we, we all, we fantasize about holiday periods sometimes 
no matter whose holiday it is, be it Eid or be it Hanukkah, or be it Diwali, be it uh, Christmas or, or whatever, Star, uh, whatever uh, Star Wars people uh, celebrate, I don't know, uh, the, uh, whatever that is, you know, times of celebration and times where society comes together to celebrate are also times when those who are marginalized feel even more so. Those who are alone, those who have mental health disorders, those people that are already on the margins of society often get pushed further away because they don't have the happy endings, you know. Um, and it can be a very lonely and very desperate time for people as well. I th I've often said that New Year's Eve is the happiest and saddest night of the year. Uh, so that COVID didn't make that happen, but it puts a lot more people in the category of not having a good night or not having a good holiday, and we should be cognizant of that. And those of us who have the joy and the possibility of a happy holiday need to think even harder mm -hmm. about how we can pick one person, just pick one person out in your life who you know will be lonely this Christmas. It doesn't have to be the whole world. You don't have to save the world. Just reach out to one other person, someone you know who you wouldn't think you'd ever call or ever make contact with. And if everyone just did that for one other person, think of what we could do, we could achieve. Uh, so, you know, we can't put that responsibility on others. What are we going to do? What's the government going to do? What is civil society? What are the NGOs going to do? Something must be done. You know, there's some, I hate the something must be done club. You know, we have big something must be done club at WHO as well, you know. Uh, I much prefer to be in the we're going to do something club. Uh, we will club. We will do something club. So this Christmas, pick, up, pick out somebody. It could be someone sitting on the street begging for the price of a meal. It could be someone who lives around the corner who happens to live alone. It can be suffering, someone suffering with long-term mental health challenges. Whatever it is, find a way. And, and then that, and it'll make you feel better. You know? Uh, it's, it's a sense of community. You know, I mean, there you have your family, you have your immediate family, and you have your friends that you make, and it's your sense of community. I spent a couple of years in Cambodia. Um, most place. fascinating time of, <laughs> of my life in terms of, of the work, and I loved it. But the sense of community in every village that we went in, with the village chief, with the, I mean, it was, they, they, they cooked a meal for us, and, they, and it was that sense of community in there, whether they were your family or not. And I saw this, you know, we, I see this in every outbreak that I'm involved in, in terms of how you reach out to people that are your neighbors. And in some, in some cultures, you know all of your neighbors. In other cultures, you don't know your neighbors. Knock on the door, knock on the wall, you know, and, and reach out. And I, I totally agree that if we could, it's this pay it forward kind of, kind of attitude of just make the connections. It doesn't have to be a physical connection, but make these connections. Drop off a care package uh, if you can. Send a delivery to somebody. Watch a movie over FaceTime with someone else if, if you can. I know people that have done that. And working with, uh, with, with older people in your families, help them figure out how to do that with you so that you watch a, a movie that's, you know, a, a, a movie that you both love and laugh together over the phone. I mean, there's ways in which you can find connections, and I think we all need to really try to make that effort beyond, um, beyond ourselves, and I think that will help. But, but the question that you had about, you know, people being alone and finding ways to reach out is, is really important. Um, but everything that they can do and everything you can do to reach out to somebody will it will make a difference. Will make a difference. Thank you very much. And uh, I, there were a lot of questions around mental health, and I think uh, I, I thank viewers for asking the questions, and I thank both of you for really be elaborative on on this, as as it's important. And as you said, we all can help someone make them feel better, but we'll also feel better playing our playing our role in our communities. Um, we went a little bit over the time. We did start later today, but we are also running out of time. We're almost entering a new year. Um, what are the what are we working on for the next year? What are the answers we want to get answered? What are the questions we want to get answered next year? Um, and what is the best way to start 2020, 2021 in your opinion? <laughs> well, I think, um, I mean, We've been thinking about this a lot in terms of what the next year will, will be. Um, I think a lot of what we're doing now needs to be reinforced and strengthened in terms of the actions that each of us take. Um, I think mentally we all need to be patient as these vaccines are unrolled um, because it will take some time for them to reach each of us. 
um, and with our goal to make sure that they that they're sent you know, to all countries of the world vaccinating those most at risk means that for everyone else it will take some time for it to reach. So we need to be patient in terms of uh, as 2021 uh, rolls in. Um, but we talk a lot about this building back better and that starts now. It doesn't start when this pandemic is over. It starts now. It's starting now. Um, and each of us think, needs to think about how we can contribute to that. Um, we're seeing changes in the world. We're seeing changes in dynamics in the world. And, you know, we're seeing voices of, of young people that uh, we've always heard, but we're, we're starting to listen to. Um, and I think those voices need to be louder. Um, and I think, you know, everyone needs to kind of give themselves a break. It's been a tough year. Um, 2021 will be better. Um, but we have to work to make it better. It won't just happen. We have to work to make it better. And I think for us, at WHO, we know we need to put in the work um, to end this pandemic. Vaccination is going to be another powerful tool that we have to end this, but we cannot give up on the on the public health and social measures that are in place. The physical distancing, the hand hygiene, the opening the windows, the respiratory etiquette, the masks. Um, and 2021 for me is a reinforcement of the basics, but I'm also looking forward to the continued innovation that we've seen. Uh, we've seen some really interesting innovation on diagnostic tests, um, in terms of making them easier uh, to to conduct either through saliva or or they can be done at home. Um, I've, we've seen some really cool innovations with uh, personal protective equipment um, and that needs to be advanced because we still have a problem with supply chain. I mean, I know it's improved over the over the course of the last year, but we still don't have enough PPE for all health workers across the world. And so that needs to be strengthened and, and reinforced. But there's really interesting innovation that's coming online for PPE, and that needs to be fostered and, and um, supported. So there's a lot of the basics, strengthening the basics, um, looking at the, the innovation that can come online and how we can advance it, and then really starting to build back the future that we want now. Um, because that will help for the next one, because there will be, but we can do more now to help make the next one less bad. Your thoughts on 2021 questions to be answered? What she said. What she said. <laughs> no more. No, Nothing no. to add. Just, uh, no, uh, no, I think uh, no, spot on, uh, Maria. Um, no, I think at the broader level, I, I, I think, you know, I, again, I feel old today, but, you know, <laughs> it's kind of having been around a while and gone through SARS and gone through Ebola and gone through pandemics and, you know, I'm, I'm starting to become cynical about our ability to actually wake up and see what's in front of us. Uh, it's really important we don't forget what happened in 2020 uh, as we hopefully celebrate getting control in 2021. Um, it's really important we realize that we are stressing our ecosystem, our biome, where we live, is not healthy, you know? Imagine if you were living in your house and you knew it was unhealthy and you were doing things to make the environment dangerous for your kids and everyone around you. You'd feel terrible. Our biome is just not healthy. Um, uh, we have, you know, we have too many people living in destitution. We have too many people who don't have access to healthcare. We have very weak essential public health functions. Our ability to work on surveillance at the animal-human interface is compromised. Our essential public health functions are weaker than they need to be. Our system is neither equitable, nor adaptable, nor resilient, nor flexible. All these things we need from our systems to protect us. Um, so we need to start making the journey next year. We need to link issues around social justice, um, uh, climate justice, health justice uh, together. Because the solutions lie in the same way around fairness and equity and sharing, sharing benefits, sharing risks. Um, and in some ways, emerging from this crisis better, uh, moving forward into a, a world in which we can, uh, you know, we don't want to be a world at threat all the time. I, the idea that we're going to tell our kids that they're going to be constantly at risk of everything happening to them is not a good thing either. We need to live our lives. We live in a beautiful planet. We live in this wonderful place. We're, we're, we're lucky to, to inhabit these bodies for the, the time that we will. Uh, we want to make that as joyful and as productive and as beautiful as we can. We're not here to suffer, uh, but we are creating the conditions in which too many people suffer. We're driving that. 
Um, and we have to pull out of that uh, to create a fairer world, a happier place for us all to be. You know, it's not all about threat and risk. Uh, we have to recognize that that exists because we, we live in a complex planet with complex risks. There is no zero risk, as you say so many times, uh, Maria. So uh, for me, that's, a, I suppose, a more philosophical perspective for 2021 is not to forget. Let's not get the amnesia of victory uh, and start believing our own bullshit. Sorry. Uh, you know, that we've had this wonderful victory against this disease and we all rah, rah, and fine. That's great. We should. But we need to realize all of the, all of the weaknesses and all of the lack of investment and all of the inequity and all of the, 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 the ignoring the risks we've done for too long. Um, because it's, I've seen it before, declare victory, move on, and then you get hit again five years later, ten years later. Uh, we, we can't, simply can't do this this time. We've lost too much, paid too big a price, um, and we need to fix it. But we can't just fix this. We've got to fix our climate. We've got to fix our social systems. We've got to fix our healthcare systems. I know it's, and we can do it because what we've demonstrated is that with solidarity and science, and with the, a bit of fairness, you can actually achieve all of this. It, this isn't, it isn't rocket science. Maybe it's a bit of rocket science, but it's, it's not rocket science. There's some rocket science, <laughs> There's some rocket science involved. Uh, apologies to all rocket scientists out there. Uh, but the solutions are in front of us, aren't they? Yeah, and and we won't always. We're not perfect. We don't get there. You know, after after the world wars of the mid century, last century, the world had to wake up and say, you know, how not again? How, not again. How, how do we? You know, we can't do this again. Uh, and uh, I think it's time for us to, to do the same. We need to recommit ourselves. Um, I actually am well, Tom Grang. I used to think of myself as a, I'm an optimist by nature. So my staff consider to me to be a pathological optimist because <laughs> <laughs> I, I tend to over. Uh, estimate the positive. And you have to in emergency management because you drive yourself nuts in the field if you wake up in the morning and think about the barriers to doing what you have to do. You, you crawl back into your sleeping bag and, and zip the tent back down. So you have to have hope. You have to move forward with a sense of purpose and hope. Um, uh, and I think when this is done, and it will be done, this will end, mm -hmm. we all need to have sit down and have a big conversation with ourselves, not just the scientists but society, about the, the world we want to live in uh, in the future. Uh, and I think, it, I actually fundamentally believe it can be better and fairer, yeah. um, but we're going to have to address some of these big issues around equity, racism, climate, infectious diseases. These are the things, these are what we face. Um, and unless we're prepared to address them, we're not going to fix our society, at a global, national, or a local level. Um, but I am, I'm an optimist. Thank you very much. And thank you for ending this on an optimist note. I think that everyone needs uh, a sign of hope and uh, optimism uh, to enter the new year and to be motivated to continue fighting ag against this virus. I will just name a few countries because the list is long of viewers uh, watching us from. Ethiopia, Sweden, Mexico, Uruguay, France, the USA, Germany, Rwanda, Lebanon, Turkey, Romania, Switzerland, Iran. Chile, Italy, Burkina Faso, uh, Nepal, Indonesia, and many others. Thank you so much for being with us today. And uh, thank you for being with us in all previous Wednesdays, asking your questions. Uh, please follow our channels, follow our website uh, with all the important and updated information on how to stay safe uh, from COVID-19 during holiday season and beyond. Can I say something before you finish? Please. Because uh, my good colleague Jerome Huffman from UNICEF uh, was with me today and he reminded me that it's the 20th anniversary of the Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network. WHO, MSF, UNICEF, CDC, so many institutions came together 20 years ago uh, to decide to work together on outbreaks. This is Gorn, right? It's all orange. Uh, but Gorn came together 20 years ago as a small group of institutions saying, and it was built on the principle that no single institution had all the capacity to deal with epidemics. That was true 20 years ago. That was true in 2020, mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. And that'll be true forevermore. So in celebrating partnership, 
and working with our partners. And there are so many others out there, like the emergency medical teams and the global health cluster of the UN system. But it's the 20th anniversary of GORN. I was there 20 years ago when we gave birth to the network. But to all our partners out there who work as part of this network, and this is a shared network between 250 institutions around the world, happy birthday. Well done. 20 years is a long time. Uh, we may not think we've made much progress, but we have. Uh, and hopefully, uh, the spirit of Gorn will stay alive over the next 20 years. So, happy birthday, Gorn. Thank you, Mike. And I will join saying thank, uh, happy birthday and, and thank you for all you've done, Gorn members, uh, emergency medical teams. And I think it's a good reminder as well to say once again, big, big thank you to health workers and all other essential workers who kept our lives and services and basic needs fulfilled during this period while many of us had to stay home. Mm -hmm. um, big and also think of another group, just one group I'd like to mention, you just have to say it, and it's parochial. Uh, my dad was a merchant seaman for 25 years, so I didn't see much of my dad when, was, when, he was, when I was young because he sailed all over the world. Think of those sailors mm -hmm. in the merchant navies around the world who have, some of them haven't been home for 12 months. Some of them haven't been able to get off their ships in the ports because of the issues of COVID. Hundreds of thousands of those seafarers, men and women, have literally kept the world moving. Yes. They have fed us. They have moved our parcels. They have moved our stuff all over the world. Um, and sometimes, you know, frontline workers or health workers are great, and they are my heroes. But, mm, you know, today my heroes are those unseen heroes, the ones who, you know, sat in the bellies of those ships kept the world moving and the same with the air crews who've kept the cargo systems running and around the world but uh, I, I think particularly today seafarers for me given my own history uh, are under recognized so we should celebrate all of these wonderful groups today and think of yourself go and just go away and think of a group in your community it could be a group of girl guides boy scouts it could be a local choir, baker, it doesn't matter who, well there's some baker in Geneva because I tell you there's donuts that come to this place once a week <laughs> that are just to die for, <laughs> so, so there are bakers keeping the world happy. Yeah, it's only once a week. <laughs> yeah, it's only one week. <laughs> exactly, sure. exactly. But farmers, yeah. and just think of all these people, the real heroes of this stores, response. Yeah. The, the grocery store shelves are full, you mm -hmm. know, I mean they continue to stay open and we have food deliveries and we have, I mean it's amazing mm -hmm. how the world. The heroes abound, yes. you know. Yeah. Anyway, sorry to interrupt your ending, but we have everyone it has was a beautiful. Role to play. And yeah. thank you to all the workers yes. who've been working tirelessly throughout this year uh, to keep us fed, to keep us safe, uh, and to keep the world going. And uh, we hope we'll we'll uh, find a way to play our role and to pay you back and to give you some rest eventually when this is over. Uh, mm. yes. Whenever that when it, when it's when over. It, when it's over. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm. Th thank you, everyone. Uh, stay safe during holidays. Happy New Year. And uh, stay with us uh, through our social media channels or website for all the updates.